Good morning. As things happen as they do at times, we had a little faux pas today and our service was not fully recorded. But no problem. I'm going to give you the sermon that we gave this morning, although it's not going to be exactly the same sermon that you would have listened to had that not occurred, but that's okay because things happen. So here we are, and our scripture that you can either stop now and read or re read later is based on the book of Exodus, beginning in the first chapter, beginning at verse 8 and continuing on through the second chapter and ending at verse 10. It's the story of Moses and his humble beginnings. Now, the title of my sermon today is Against All Odds. And miracles happen every day. They truly, truly do. And sometimes we don't understand what God has in store for us. And in our world, we have people who are doubters. They don't believe in miracles. They don't think that God intervenes at all. Everything that happens according to the unbeliever is a coincidence, a mere coincidence. But if I were to ask any one of you right now to tell me a story about a miracle, you would be able to do so because miracles have happened in all of our lives. God has a way of intervening in man's life in a good way and in a wonderful way and in a way that we never would expect. Usually these things occur with health crises. Some, maybe it's a friend or a relative or even yourself. And the doctor has diagnosed you with something that you just feel is devastating and you don't know where to go. You don't know what to do. You're scared and you're apprehensive, but you take it to the Lord in prayer. And there are so many times when people have gone to the doctor after such an experience and found out that he takes another scan, he takes another test, and suddenly whatever they told you has changed and it's no longer there. And somehow a miracle has occurred in your life and you are no longer plagued with the disease. Sometimes Doctors give us too much concern. They tell us these things and make faces and say things that we don't understand. And we get anxious and we worry and we can't do anything in our lives until we get those test results. And it's quite damaging. Imagine the story as it unfolds today from the book of Exodus. And then decide what in your life is most important. Our text unfolds with fear and anxiety. It starts with a new king coming to the throne into the land of Egypt, and immediately he notices this problem. There are too many Israelites. What's he going to do with this? What's he going to do about it? He has to do something. So he decides that, well, I will do something. But his ways were not the ways of God. And so it was quite hard for him to make the right decision, I'm sure. But how do these Israelites do it, he wondered. How do they worship just this one God? The Egyptians had many, many gods. It started with Ra, who was known as, also as the sun god. And from him, an entire lineage of gods came about. Now, they also worship cats, which is where we get that, that cats rule. And it's true, cats do rule. But that's because of the god Bastet. It's an Egyptian thing. But we still say it. Now, the cats... They had nothing to do with it. It was all because people decided that these were their set of gods. And no matter what, they lived by that. We live by one God. The Israelites continued to have children. And this was a major problem. Why did they keep having children? Why couldn't they just stop? So the king decided, well, his first thing was, I'm going to make them work harder. Now you and I know if we work a 10 or 12 hour day, we go home totally exhausted. Even a regular day, sometimes you go home, you sit down for a minute, and you're out cold. You're tired. So he figured if he worked the Israelite slave men even harder, they would go home too tired to have relations with their wives, and they would simply not have as many children. It didn't work. He didn't understand why it didn't work. He had no idea why it didn't work. So... Now he had to move forward, and he had to come up with another idea. So midwifery is nothing new. In fact, it was first recorded in the Bible in the book of Genesis, and the midwives were in existence way back then. But much later, in 1765, the term became more well-known as people began to be trained for this type of work. And later, in 1920, the first woman to take on the position was Mary Breckenridge, Yet the first name midwives in the Bible 
are the two that we name here in Exodus, Shifra and Pua. Now, Shifra and Pua were God-fearing women. And the king decided that the next step was to have the midwives kill the infants if they were baby boys. If they were girls, they could live. But if they were boys, the king ordered them, ordered the midwives to kill these baby boys as they were being born. How horrible. How absolutely heinous. For us, we can't even think about it. This was not a time when women had the choice of having an abortion or giving the baby up for adoption. They didn't do that so much then. They had the, uh, the means to, of course, give a baby away, and some, I'm sure, did. But it was rare. Most women took care of their children, and they had their children unless there was a health problem where the baby died at birth. But these babies were being born, and they were fine. But the king was telling these midwives to kill them. Now, Sifra and Pua, they couldn't do it because they feared God too much. So they made up a story. Sometimes a little white lie isn't a bad thing. So their little white lie was to tell the Pharaoh that, you know, the Israelite women, they're a strong bunch. They keep having the babies before we get there. We get there and bam, the baby's born. What are we supposed to do, Your Highness? We're not going to kill them then. We can't do anything. They're there. What are we supposed to do? It's just too hard. Well, the Pharaoh fell for this. And they were, of course, afraid for their lives because had they been caught, he could have killed them. But God was on their side. So even this little white lie, although not recommended, is something that I'm sure God has to allow from time to time. Now, he wanted them next. He decided as soon as the baby boys were born, throw them in the Nile River to drown. It just kept getting worse and worse and worse. But we have learned through our own lives that we can survive against all odds. Some have been involved in some serious accidents. Maybe you yourself have had an incident where you just thought you would not live. There have been times where life-threatening things have happened to us and people lay on their hospital beds and their family is gathered around, everyone saying goodbye and rendering many, many prayers. And then they survive and people can't explain how they survive, but our prayer life is that important. When one prays, it's a good thing, but when we have difficulties and we ask others to pray as we do on our lengthy prayer list, it's important and it's good because God likes when a lot of people are praying for the same cause. And it's not that he doesn't hear the one prayer he does, but when many, many pray as one voice and lift up a person Miracles do indeed happen, and we've seen it in our own congregation, and perhaps you've seen it in your own life. So in the beginning of Exodus, which means a mass deport, departure, departure excuse me, from a country usually associated with immigrants, the Israelites, of course, were slaves in this land. And the baby Moses is now born, a regular child in every way, normal birth, but his mother refuses to throw him into the Nile River to perish. Instead, she hid him for three months. Now imagine hiding an infant baby for three months. We can't even take him out to restaurants to eat without a baby crying. You can't go on a plane. People just shudder when you sit next to them if you have an infant with you because they know they're going to cry, but babies cry. How else is a baby supposed to let an adult know what's wrong with them if they don't cry? It's their only way of speaking to us at that point. They have no words yet. They haven't learned anything. They're too little. So it, it was a great fear, I'm sure, for the mother of Moses to go through and to somehow miraculously go for these full 90 days, approximately, to keep this child quiet. But finally, she decides it's getting too much for whatever reasons, whatever happened. So she places him in a basket and puts him into the Nile River, float and watching, ever watching, was his older sister, who we then are named, known is named Miriam. But when we think about these odds, you know, anything could have happened. He could have floated down the river, a current could have come along and swept the little basket away, he could have rolled over, a number of things could have happened, but it didn't. And you have to also realize, Moses' mother did her homework. She watched every day and found out that the princess, the Pharaoh's daughter, came to this area of the Nile, to do her morning rituals. And so she knew and hoped and prayed that maybe 
Just maybe the princess would even be the one to take mercy on this infant. And that was exactly what happened. We don't know why the Pharaoh even allowed it. Maybe the Pharaoh didn't know. Maybe she was good at hiding the baby as Moses' mother was. And she named him Moses, of course, because she had pulled him out of the water. But we hear and read of some just amazing stories in our world. We get the news of miracles all the time, but some are recognized and spoken of, and some, against all odds, against everything, are never heard about. We, God knows how to make his plans, though, for our future. Sometimes we don't know where we're going in life, but he's always watching over us. But sometimes we're like that helpful in, helpless infant so often, more than not. But Moses, though being drawn from the water, had a lot more in his life ahead of him. And God had so much in store for this child, more than anyone could have imagined. And his mother saved him. An Egyptian woman saved him. His sister saved him. And now God was going to be able to use him. Every hero has a beginning, you know? Every hero, every leader of the world, good or evil, started out as a helpless baby infant. And redundant, of course. And all the great ones, they had to be taught how to do what they do. A tenor doesn't simply go on a stage and sing perfectly. He practices for hours and years and hours and hours every day. So he is at his perfection for a performance. A leader does not simply get up and lead. He has to be shown how to do it and guided and directed and given help. And he has to watch others. Athletes, they train for years in strength and endurance in, all, in order to compete in their given sport. Moses would one day say he was not a leader. And God would say to him, oh, but Moses, you will be. He would say he couldn't speak, but God would take care of that and give him an easy out. Moses would claim that he was just a simple shepherd, and how could he possibly shepherd a people? But he would be a great shepherd, just as David would be a great shepherd. And David begins as a, as a humble shepherd. And Jesus calls himself shepherd many times in the New Testament. But instead of the little white fuzzy lambs, Moses was going to be one day shepherding the people. Now people are referred to as sheep in the Bible many times because they need a good shepherd to lead them. We are sheep and we do wander off. And just like that good shepherd, they never give up on the shepherd never gives up on his flock and neither does God give up on his people. Sometimes we think they're fearless, but they have their own fears. We all have our own fears. But a sheep is not lost forever to God. We can do some amazing things when we put our minds to it. We can come up with ideas that no one ever came up with before. We can invent inventions like the recording devices we're using today. No one would have thought of that in the 1930s. No one. They were barely having video, having movies to go to, and then they were calling them talkies after a while, and then they came up with Technicolor. The Wizard of Oz, first movie to come out in Technicolor. Amazing, 1939. But when we finally get where we want to be, isn't it funny how there's always more to come? That's the way Moses' life was going to be, too. Even though he got to a certain point and God told him, I'm going to have you lead these people, there was so much more that God had in for Moses. And he does that, too. When I was a kid, I liked to teach Bible, I liked to read Bible stories, and I wanted to teach them. I thought about being a teacher, but that never happened. And then I had two jobs for many years. And finally, my pastor in my other church asked the question if I thought I would like to be a pastor. And at first, I kind of thought it was funny. I thought, I don't know. You know, I don't think I could do that. But, you know, once an idea is put in your head, it's amazing how it can stick there. And that idea stuck for me. They call that a calling when you can't get it away, when you can't push it away no matter what, because God wants to use you for a purpose. And God uses so many people in the world for so many things, and you think, why would I want to do that? Why would I, how would I be able to do that? What does it involve? And these were all the questions that I had. But, you know, we all have our 
are beginnings, and there may be odds stacked against you. Did you think when you were a teenager you were going to be doing what you're doing now? Did you think when you were growing up that you would have children if you have children, or that you would become the, do the job you are currently doing? Many of us, when we're growing up, have this 12-year-old's list, and we go down and we say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to have kids, I'm going to get married. Did you ever think you'd be married to the person you are married to? Did you ever think you'd have the job you do or did? Did you ever think you'd have these children that you may have? Your 12-year-old self may have had a certain thing on that list, but just look back in your life and see how much it has changed because God has this purpose for us. And whatever the odds are, he's going to make it happen. So Moses was called. And Moses had to be content being a shepherd for a while. He had to stay out of the limelight because when he becomes an adult, he commits the number one thing that will be on the list of Ten Commandments not to do, murder. He became so enraged as a young man while out in the field, seeing an overseer one day beating on an Israelite servant so, poor, so badly that Moses becomes so enraged that he grabs that man's weapon and turns it upon himself and kills the overseer. Then he buries him in a shallow grave and he leaves Egypt. Don't look, doesn't want to look back. That's how he became a shepherd. He finally winds up marrying and his, his father-in-law, Jethro, was a sheep herder. And Moses simply worked for him. He stayed out of the limelight. He kept a low profile, as they say. He didn't get any trouble and he figured that he was a fugitive, but so what? Who was going to ever find him? He was way far away from the land of Egypt. And then God calls him to go back exactly where he didn't want to go. At times, Moses would have been called anything but hero. And in fact, our heroes in the world today are usually unlikely heroes. We don't expect to be a hero to anyone growing up. We don't expect to wear a cape. We just expect to be a good person. And that's really all that God expects. But every once in a while, he uses one of us to become a hero. And Moses is definitely going to become that hero. When God is on our side, we can do anything. Absolutely anything we want to do. But at times, God does it in a way that we don't expect. When we are called to do something, God will not let it go. So his goals for us may be many. And we can attain his goals in our life against all the odds. Amen. Please join me with your hearts and your heads in prayer at this time. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this day so thankful for the day you have given us. It's turning out to be a beautiful sunny day. And Lord, we know that we have gone through a lot lately and we still feel disconnected from one another. But know that we are still here. And we know that you are still here guarding, guiding us and directing us and always being with us. We pray for our shut-ins as this time is so devastating for them. We pray for all our congregants and the many people on the prayer list who have many, many health needs and concerns and other things going on right now. We know, Lord, that as we lift up as a voice of one, you will hear us. We know, Lord, that you have heard us in the past and have performed great miracles. Lord, we pray at this time for our leaders of our church. We pray for Bishop Johnson and District Superintendent Dr. Foster. And we just pray for all persons spreading the word. When we pray for our country and our leaders and pray that they guide us in the right way, in the right direction, Lord, we know there is so much that has gone on in life and will continue to. But we pray for your continued guidance to take us where it is that you need us to go. In thy name, amen. And then please join me for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. That ends the sermon that has been repeated now for you. I hope you have enjoyed it and will continue to tune in with us and we will see you next time with a more involved sermon for you and some music and you just never know what we're going to do to fill in the time so have a wonderful and blessed day